Thank you so much for having me. And again, I cannot see the chat, so feel free to unmute yourself. And I hope you can see my slides and hear me. Is that good, Claire? Yes, we can see it clearly. Thanks so much. Very good. So, and if I don't, if I make myself fall asleep, you can just give me a little nudge as well. I'm so happy to be with you. And I did wake up naturally at 3.30 in the morning, so don't feel too bad. Um, but I'm not quite sure what time to eat, so I just keep eating throughout the day. Um, so I am in the U.S., um, and I am happy to speak with you a little bit about in-person escape rooms, which is a bit, bit more of my experience. And again, given that this is a free conference and budgets, and I hear about faculty cuts and all these kinds of things, hoping to give you some really practical, down-to-earth ideas for some in-person escape rooms um, in our time today. Um, my contact information is here, and you're always more than welcome to contact me. Um, my background, though, is not in gamification or gaming, so many of you have quite a bit more experience than that, so I will note that as probably a, a something lacking in my presentation that you could probably very much add to it. I am a registered nurse and I teach in the undergraduate program at the School of Nursing here um, in Indianapolis, Indiana, in the Midwest of the United States. Though so I am from Texas, so every once in a while you might hear a y'all. Uh, come out um, as well. And I have um, conducted escape rooms and studied them, published on them as well. Um, I have no conflicts of interest, no funding, no sponsorship, so it works, I guess, with the topic. And I welcome your ideas and um, input at any time. Please feel free. And I am super practical, so I tend to like to leave conferences both with a great network of people I have met, as well as ideas of to-dos. So I'm a little bit more of the, you know, tactical type things is kind of where I have focused my time today. So um, I'm going to discuss some of why you might consider an in-person escape room as opposed to potentially an online escape room. The both are so useful. Um, I tend to teach on campus students, so that's where I have gotten most of my experience and have done some for um, by my college students, both sophomores and juniors and different content areas. I've also done it during the pandemic um, with a fourth grade class while I was in person, they were online. I've done it for a fifth grade class. I've done it, you know, a couple different kind of scenarios and groups. So you'll see some of those different things come through with some of my idea types. And um, I just had to pick a few. So there's probably many more you can find online as well. And then I'm going to end with some practical considerations in managing in-person escape rooms, which might be things that you've considered a bit with online, but maybe a, a few differences with uh, your in-person. So first, let's talk a little bit about the benefits and drawbacks of in-person and why you might consider them. And hopefully your learning, their approaches to learning and experiences for your students are based on the needs of the students. And so um, you could see some of these um, being more appropriate for one group or another. As we've talked about some groups who are online and busy, um, if that's kind of more your environment or if you tend to teach an on-campus group. So the benefits of online, and I think you do see some of this, excuse me, benefits of in-person, um, you do see some of this with your online escape rooms as well, but I love seeing the teamwork and team building that happens in my in-person escape rooms. I have classes of up to 86 students. Um, I think probably as far as an escape room, the biggest I've done is 50 or 60 students. I'm hearing a bit of a feedback. I don't know if that's just me. Um, so this is a picture of some of my students. So sometimes I have to manage all of them at once. I don't have a whole lot of resources or time with them. So I'll put them in groups for doing their um, escape kind of boxes um, during our time together. And it's really fun to hear them talk with one another, how it's kind of quiet and how they build in their communication and their um, speaking with one another. Um, I tend to see a lot of collaboration. I love how engaged they are. I don't see them fiddling on their phones ever, um, which occasionally would happen during class time. That communication piece, like we've talked about, problem solving, how they delegate with one another. You see natural leaders start to come about and even some competition as they compare, if you have them perhaps all in the same room, as they compare with other groups. I don't really set it out to be competitive um, at all. In fact, I just try to have them get out on time. Um, there's no prize for one who's better than another as far as their speed, but they do sometimes like to do that with one another. Some other neat things is the faculty involvement. You can really see the different groups and how they're functioning. You can see how certain students are doing. 
Um, you can provide that assistance. You can observe their facial expressions, how they're interacting, and see if they need some help before they have asked for hints or help. So sometimes that's really helpful to assess, um, you know, kind of do some formative assessment of your students. And you can also provide clues um, or help with tasks. If a task is not working, you can help that way. Um, I also, one interesting thing is that the participants can also move around. And perhaps you've been sitting in the same spot today a little bit. There is something beneficial about the ability to move around. Um, I think for our learners as well, that may be needing to be considered. Um, so I think there's also that ability perhaps to facilitate a little bit more effectively to create an ambiance environment, as we've talked about before, with sound, lights, costumes, that type of thing as well as I have used. Um, and also there's different types of puzzles that can be used in person versus online as well. So there's obviously limitations in one or the other as far as what kind of ones you can do. Also, I just love seeing the soft skills practice that students um, get to do during their uh, times together. So in some of my work with others, I have discovered in some focus groups some of these soft skills that students get to, you know, to practice. They don't necessarily, I wouldn't say learn them, but they're able to use some of these skills, such as constructive correction, which you might obviously see if you do an an asynchronous session for your students as well, as they correct one another with puzzles, the idea of building consensus with the team as they teach others, um, developing leadership. Um, even if I don't assign team leaders, that seems to kind of naturally come out. Um, the ability to request help and all within a time limited setting. And that in my field of healthcare is very important. Um, sometimes I have students who just have forever to study, um, but when it comes to these games, they really don't have forever. So they have to kind of move themselves along more quickly. So that is very helpful. Some drawbacks, obviously there with any of our um, options there is a cost associated with any form but i think we've seen today that there's some licensing costs potentially with some virtual escape rooms as well um, but i'm going to talk about and share with you some costs of some potential ones you can use that really are pretty uh, cost effect effective. Another drawback with um, in-person is there is a time to reset the room. So if you do one group and then the next group comes in, the next group comes in, you have that time, or semester to semester, you might have some reset time. This would be shortened if you're using the same supplies over and over for the same escape room, but it's lengthened if you have several different escape rooms that you're running. So that is a little bit of a, a factor too. I always suggest resetting all of your locks back to zero, 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 or unlocking them, that type of thing, so that you can easily get them open next time, as I have found to be quite a problem myself. And also there's a little bit of a personnel need with regard to facilitation of the room. And that again varies based on the timing, excuse me, the group size that you have, which I'll mention a little bit later in the presentation. Okay, so here's some in-person puzzle ideas, but let's first consider a few things. As we've talked about throughout the day today, the goals and outcomes of your escape room environment, what you're trying to have your students accomplish, what information you're wanting them to use, what are you wanting them to do. Um, you could have it be an introduction to new content. I have found um, at least that I don't believe it's the best way to learn new content. Um, unless because of the time frame, I tend to see people rush through a bit. So if they're really trying to digest and learn new content, it might be a challenge. If, it, if you're wanting them to just skim information or kind of get introduced to information, that might be a use of it as well. Um, I use it a lot for application of knowledge. We have um, application type questions on our licensing exams. So that's one thing that we include throughout. I also use it at the end of semester as I think students should know all the information, but surprise, surprise, they don't. So it's a great way for them to self-assess and to understand what they know and what they don't know. Um, so it's a great way to, to kind of retouch on things. And as we talk about learning and how it happens best, it's always good to go back to what we think we've forgotten and um, they really, uh, that learning is enhanced. And then also the soft skills, teamwork, collaboration, communication piece really is an important part of escape rooms as well. And that's something that can be done with simulation and that in-person experiences um, as well. But I just think that's so, so much an enhanced part of things as opposed to just basic studying. Also, it's good to consider, as we've mentioned before, what existing resources and environment you have. That is a way, great way to cut costs is just to see what you already have. So do you have a simulation center? Do you have boxes? Do you have locks? Do you have you know, equipment, supplies, calculators, whatever that can be used here in your 
event. You also want to see if you can include activities that you would already be wanting your learners to do. So if maybe one way, another way to assess this learning, have the students be practicing is with a case study or something. Is there a way to kind of include that in the escape room? So maybe there's role play, maybe practice questions, um, simulation. I've heard of people using kind of simulation and doing an escape room kind of at the same time. Maybe it's a procedural set of tasks you're trying to have them do. Use technology for me, perhaps an um, IV pump that they're going to use, making calculations. There's so many different ways to include, obviously, those things that you already wouldn't be having them do, but have it done in this setting as well. Okay, so here's a puzzle. If you would like, you can... Uh, I'm going to see, well, I don't know if I'll be able to escape and see. I wonder if someone can unmute and see what they think this means. Let's give you give you a little bit of time now. And if you do want in the chat, I'll be able to feed that back. So okay. don't worry. Yeah. Great. So again, if you want to say got it, and then we'll maybe come back to the first person who jumps in with the answers. Is it two separate ones, Brianna? It is. So you'll see the minus and the plus here, and then it kind of restarts over here at the bottom. So, so the top two, line so and the bottom. Yes, I'm sorry, I don't believe you can see my mouse. <laughs> so. so we've got one person who's got the second. So Michael, I'm with you. I've got the second. Oh, second again. This one is tricky the first time, and my colleague actually, Heidi Uckel, developed this, so it is a little bit tricky. Wait and see if we get any first before we move on, I think. Sure. Maybe this mm. the, the third image of the little figure can help you the most. I think that was the hint, Rosemary. <laughs> Oh, Michael's now got both. So you're going to be the one coming to tell us, I think, then. So second, Angiotis has got them. So th I've got the second as well. OK, are we ready? Yeah. So Michael, I, I think this has happened to you before today that you were first. So do you want to come on and <laughs> share? run away on me have you is it working sure if his microphone's working so who was second pangiotis do you want to come in with the second word because you were next for that one room Mm -hmm. Room. It is. I, I can give the answer now. Is that okay? Do you think, Claire? Yeah, I think that's so it, time. It's it's screw minus crew, so it's, it's kind of this s sound, and then there's a cape, escape room. So this is a rebus puzzle. I think you love them or you hate them. Um, I've heard, and I've heard it's also hard to remember the name Rebus Puzzle, but this is one way you could use it. I've done this type of thing with medication names. It does take a little bit of kind of thinking sometimes, and to be honest, it was not my student's favorite task. But let's move on from this uh, option. So I have several options. So this is probably the most straightforward one you would think of. It's just various types of questions. And in the um, slides that I have, I have some things that are hidden slides that give some other examples, but I figured they were more straightforward. So different practice questions that relate to your discipline or topic could be used. Um, crosswords, and there's great crossword making um, online options that do all the work for you. Um, fill in the blank. This is one that I use um, on different types of what's called shock. And when people put in the answers, as you can see on that second column, it creates a word, a couple words on the bottom. 
that spell on cash. So the people get a, p a cash, they get money, and um, they use a black light pen, and that black light pen reveals the name of the next task. Um, so you can use those things, you know, maybe there's perhaps questions that you'd have them do um, already, but you just have it linked to something different. So you can use crosswords where you indicate um, which, you know, that there's, you circle certain ones in black light pen or you indicate a number and that creates a word of some sort or something to do. So that is one um, pretty easy option. Another option is jigsaw puzzles, and I put the prices at which I could find some of these things, and the notes will have information about where you can find them. Some of them, obviously, are cheaper when you buy them in multi-pack options, but they might you might have a very simple puzzle that is just a blank puzzle, it appears to the learner, but then you could have secret messages written on it. You could have it actually have something that is visible to the eye as well. Um, and then the black light pens, which is a pretty classic um, for you, those of you who are newer at escape rooms and that has that little uh, light at the bottom. It is quite interesting how many struggle to know what that, how that thing works um, as well, but that can provide some information for a, a subsequent task or riddle as well. Another one that is um, likewise pretty easy is uh, red decoders. So there are just little, that's, there's lots of different versions. This one's just kind of a paper version. There are more uh, durable options as well. If you buy them in a pack, they're pretty inexpensive. Um, you can create these either um, in printed form or written form. I've tended to find that writing out whatever it is you're going to write in light blue or printing in a light blue, it takes some testing on exactly what color light blue um, that that works and then you scribble over it or print over it with different colors of red, yellow, orange, and pink so that you cannot easily see the image underneath. Um, I have used this to have a riddle or a letter. It can also have like a tool of some sort. So maybe there's some scoring tool that the people may not readily have memorized and so then they can use that tool throughout the game. Um, so that one is a fun uh, and expensive one. Um, here in the U.S. we call them popsicle sticks, but I've heard that they're called lolly sticks, perhaps where you are. Um, this is another inexpensive one that you can get um, at uh, inexpensive stores. You can write a secret message. You can have an image on these. It is probably helpful to have some type of um, system, so a different color system so they can know how to put them in order or some type of uh, line or something that indicates how these or, you know, line up. Um, these can be used as not necessarily a um, red herring, but it could be a, a hint throughout or one of the tasks involved in your escape room. Another is inexpensive boxes or containers. And I looked online and found some that you might see close to where you are. And those again are in the notes um, as well. So there's several options of those. Um, I have found several, um, we call them in the US, the dollar store, but I guess, the, I, I, was it Poundland, I guess, where you are? So little ones like that are um, pretty inexpensive that you can drill little holes in um, to slide in your, um, your little locks as well. So you might still maybe purchase a few little locks, but um, not spend a lot of time. Um, this is a little earbud case um, that was super convenient that I had to experiment with a little bit, but poked some little holes and then created a little case as well. This one was great because when you opened it, it popped and it had confetti in it. So it kind of gave a fun effect. You can use various types of bags. I have mesh bags as well. So you might have some of these things already around um, your environment that you can use. And then you can use those little programmable three or four digit locks as well. Hidden messages are another great thing we've talked about throughout the day. So black light pens um, is a great classic thing to have. Um, or colored lettering, lettering, which I will show you some examples of and cut out or marked overlays. I've also read some about using lemon um, from lemons in order to create hidden messages. I experimented and didn't find it to be the most effective, um, but if you are able to make that work, that could be an option as well. So here's some things with colored lettering. Perhaps you have a, um, an, a letter or an image or something that has different letters. And this one here, the red spells something that's pretty the most, most predominant thing that you can read. Um, and there's also something in purple. So the red says unscramble the letters in the cafe tables. And so that tells them to go to that location. 
the purple says, and this was for a fifth grade escape room about stolen party supplies. Uh, party supplies stolen. Who took them? I know it's Mrs. Mary. Um, so you can have those used different ways. You can also have them spell acrostics or have them be jumbled up and uh, be used. Another way to perhaps direct them without, you could use the color or not, is to use an overlay or transparency um, paper. And so you can have certain things um, circled that then they would lay over the image in order to indicate a message. Secret compartments um, are nice things as well. Perhaps books, boxes, vases. Um, so you can hide things in vases. So maybe they would have to be able to um, get to the bottom of that. I've also read some about candles, about melting candles to get to things. Maybe a bit of a hazard perhaps, um, but you can have those um, have secret compartments. So I, you might have old books that you don't know what to do with. Well, I have found the answer. So this one took a bit of work, but you can cut out the middle um, of that old book and put in some type of, of key system um, within that uh, as well. Maps and hidden locations. So I've used maps and so maybe one of the puzzles indicates to go to the library and so the map would be useful for that. Hidden locations as we've talked about a bit today. This one I had, I had some letters inside of a blown up balloon that was hidden. They could pop the balloon and out came the letters. There were several different letters. Um, some of them on the back had magnetic uh, tape and they had some magnets in their toolbox of, of stuff that they had been had received and so that tells them where to go. So this was a place called the cove that they needed to go to next. You can also have hidden items that you're giving them indication of where to go um, to find different tools they might need. Maybe they need a screwdriver or hammer or something like that. Um, maybe they need a calculator for a calculation that could be opened. Batteries in order to make some type of device work. These can also include the titles of the next task or location. I've used beads on a string that are letter beads in order to indicate where to go. They could need their beads plus the beads of another couple teams in order to find a location. It could be several different things. Um, you could use this to find a ladder or a step stool or a hook um, in order to reach something that otherwise they would be unable to get just themselves. You could help them find data that they might need in order to solve things, perhaps the lab value number for healthcare escape room, or as we talked about with chemistry, it could be a number uh, system needed to find some uh, chemical compound. Ciphers and codes, um, these are, as we've mentioned, all over the place, lots of good options with these. Um, I, I sometimes think that we get make these a little bit too hard. It, it depends really on what your goal is of your escape room. Um, if you're trying to just add a little layer of fun and depth, um, maybe don't get too into the weeds on this. Some people, these they kind of get this real quick and some, if they're not used to this, this could be a little bit more challenging. Um, so I've used um, some of these things here, Braille, Cypher Wheel, um, and there's many other ciphers you can find online. And I'll show you about styrofoam cups, transparencies, and secret code breakers. So this one is a very inexpensive way to do one as well. So this one, you can have some type of message that indicates how to put the cups in order. That's one thing you can do. And on the bottom, it could have a message that helps you indicate which order it is. And then they have to make those letters line up. You can add in extra letters that help make it more confusing, but I found it's very difficult to write on the styrofoam cups exactly correctly such that you get that right message. But this one uses this cipher plus the decoder wheel, so it has that the code is YAK, and that's actually a numeric code. And so once they use that decoder, it gives you a number to open a lock of your next thing. There's also Braille, so you can print out a Braille thing uh, online. Transparencies could be used to help to um, line up that more easily for your learners if you'd like, um, and that could give them a code or a location or a word for your next uh, object. 
There's always ways, like we talked about previously, to in include hybrid options, including technology. So QR codes, they could maybe need to find a phone or a piece of technology in order to open the QR code. They could need a code to get into that device and then get to the QR code option. So that could just be a whole part of your system. Um, the QR code could open up another puzzle that's online. It could open up a cipher. It could open up a video. So one thing I've done is I've had a colleague that um, helped me with creating a video and she had lost the answers to her recent final. The students were pounding at the door in order to get the information. So we had this um, FaceTime video that was recorded and put in an online video that then this could be linked to for your learners. It could include contact information, locations, hints, different things that you can use with that. Um, they can use phones and computers even in their own. Um, and I also have found too that old technology, perhaps you have an old phone that you don't use anymore. That's a great way to include uh, some technology as well. They could have to respond to somebody via text. So I've had somebody outside of the room respond to their text message answer, and that can give them direction on where to go next or different apps. Google Forms is another way to include kind of this hybrid option. Um, and you could also have them video chat with somebody. Perhaps they need to talk to the doctor or something during the escape room. And I would, you, I'm sure you know about these, but programmable locks, it might be good to just have a few of these. Um, you can get them in packs and make them less expensive. There's different options with regard to the flexibility of the um, this little system here. So you might find that you want it to be flexible or not, and that can vary based on what you're using it to lock. So just be thoughtful about those options. And again, I do recommend that you reprogram them back to 000 when you're done. So you're not like me trying to get the 898 code, having gone through all of the potential options on the lock. There's also alphabetic locks and alphanumeric as well. Key locks, and you could have the keys hidden somewhere. Um, so there's lot, there's drawer locks. Um, they're a little bit more expensive that could um, lock a, a drawer that has things um, in there. Um, if you maybe are limiting your cost as well, consider folders with puzzle names on them, and perhaps the previous task gives them the name of that folder to open. So in the pre-brief, I would tell my learners that the things are got done in a certain, certain sequence, so don't start opening things until you've been instructed to do so throughout the game, and that will become evident throughout. Um, so that usually keeps them at bay, but this is a good reason why you have some facilitators to help to monitor that and see if they've skipped ahead a few tasks. Another thing is zip ties and scissors, and I'll show you that, and keys to various locations. So I have a motion lock here, and this one you can use for various things. Um, so I teach something called heart failure, and there's left-sided and right-sided heart failure, so I've done it with that. You can also just label these things as different things, and the, the learners have to move this lock in different directions, and that would open it. So I have the keys locked into the system, or excuse me, the scissors locked into the system. I guess you could go do keys as well, and those scissors would be needed to open a zip tie that opens something as well. I will say, I don't know how it is in the UK, but um, these lock prices have gone up quite a bit, I think they're $65 now, but there are other ways with that hard lock system to lock um, scissors or other devices they might need. This one I do indicate that it must be opened with scissors. Another way to be, because they could open the zipper otherwise, another way to do it would be have a more firm, like a box or something that um, would need to be opened. There are multiple other ideas and you can just look online and there's so many different options. Mazes in which the maze creates a shape or a figure or a Roman numeral or something that could give them indication of where to go next. Riddles, I would be a little bit cautious with riddles if you're really trying to have people learn things. Um, sometimes they can get flustered with them. So I sometimes try to make them a little bit more obvious. Um, it probably just depends on your audience and what your goals are and how to handle those things. We've mentioned rebus puzzle options, use of equipment for the student's profession. So I've used IV pumps. Um, you could use different mannequin devices. Um, you could use blood pressure equipment, and that can vary obviously based on your background. Locked diaries are very inexpensive things. A highlighted or marked book or a dictionary that um, translates things from different languages, that can be helpful. And then photos or images um, that can give some direction as well. A few thoughts on managing an in-person group. 
here because it is a little bit different. Um, as you design, as we've talked about throughout the day, design toward your intended outcomes with your objectives as far as learning objectives or assessment and how you want your students to engage with each other. So I've really had to think about this. Sometimes I would print out um, five copies of the same puzzle so everyone in the group got a copy, but then they would all do their own and they wouldn't collaborate. So I now print them out in like strips, question one, two, three, four, five. And so they have to pass them around or at least talk to each other. Or I indicate in the directions, please solve independently and then work together. Something like that to see how, how it is that you're wanting the group to be interacting. Um, so be thoughtful about those options as well. Allow adequate preparation time. Those of you that have done this, it takes a lot longer than you think. And even when you're redoing something, it can take a bit of time to get things reset. When I've had done different group sizes, I go, oh no, I don't have enough locks of this type. So those are things to consider as well with your preparation time and planning for your potential cost. I hope that these are some ways that you can reduce that cost. Um, pretty significantly and maybe just get a few good locks and things to help throughout, but there's lots of different ways besides locks to do things. And we talked about different gamification and design principles as well. And it is very, very good to pilot this. I had not done that initially and I did a crossword and I thought, oh, for sure they'd get this. And they were stumped, I think for 30 or 45 minutes. And this was when I was first doing this. We had plenty of time, but it was ridiculous. So I, I always start with an easy task first. That's how tests are best designed as well. So start with something that gets them kind of going. Um, and that one should just be very quick. It take them less than a couple minutes. So pilot it. I like to pilot with my senior students. Um, they come back and they think it's fun to come back and to remember stuff and kind of, they kind of feel professional. Um, when I've done escape rooms for professional conferences as well, I use them and they're great. And they have more of that peer kind of um, understanding, but are also able to give good feedback. So then you can evaluate and redesign and reevaluate and don't be afraid to take out a task, change a task, put it back in, see how it goes. Um, that just is kind of part of that process. I do have a link here to a design template. There might be others that are just as good or significantly better, um, but I'm designing an escape room right now for um, some high school students to kind of get them interested in the healthcare field. And I even have used this and it's given me some ideas to get going. It's pretty simple, um, but you're welcome to use that if you'd like to give you some ideas. Some thoughts with managing an in-person escape room. I like to start with a trailer. I use iMovie and find that to be very user friendly. Um, I am not super tech savvy, so I find images on unsplash.com that are not copyrighted and I put those in there. Um, and that already does the music. I just put in the words. I do test it a few times to make sure that all of the graphics work out well, but the students seem to love the trailer even though iMovie did the hard work. And that gets them kind of going with kind of getting excited about the escape room. I tend to show that if I can a week or so prior to the event so that they're excited about it. And then dividing them into groups is something to be thoughtful about as well. I use, use Chinese finger traps with letters on them to give them the letter of their team name and the letters spell out escape room. Uh, but you can do other ways. I would be very cautious though. Sometimes I end up with a group of my, my students who are struggling. And if you have a group of struggling students, it's not a surprise that they're going to struggle throughout. So you might want to have some discretion over potentially moving people around um, to kind of even out the groups because um, you it is nice to have that variety of, of group ability. I do have a pre-brief that kind of gives a bit about the storyline, what their intended goal is, how they're going to receive help, how long they have, that type of thing is very helpful. Um, and also the rules, what they can and cannot do, what their goal is. I tend to find in my experience that a group of size of four to five is just about right for the type that I do. Um, that allows for everyone to be involved. If you have too many, I tend to find that there's one or two that are starting to kind of pull back and are not involved in the group. If I have too few, then they just kind of seem to stall out a little bit more. So that's what I found to be my happy medium, but that can really depend on your design. Mine tend to be, you know, linear escape rooms, uh, but it can vary a bit. I tend to find that having facilitators of one facilitator to two groups seems to be about right, the right number. Um, I 
prep those facilitators, I give them a table that indicates the task, the available hints, the answers, and go through that with them, show them the tasks, and also tell them how they are able to provide hints. For mine, I tend to allow the students three or four hints, depending. Um, if they use a person for help, that counts as two. If they use a resource such as a textbook, that counts as one. So I'm trying to drive them back to their available resources. Um, but then I also do come around and help and facilitate as well. And then I do have adequate time for debrief. I tend to find though that they are exhausted um, at the end of this, so that is a little bit hard. I tend to have, um, after the escape room, we have pictures, and so they hold up signs that say, I escaped, or we did it, or I killed my patient, or something like that. <laughs> they didn't. Anyway, so when um, we get pictures, then I have something for them to do afterwards. So I have QR codes with practice questions or an activity to do. So there's a, an anchoring task for them to have something to come back to. And then when that time has expired, I give them a bit of a stretch break. I give them debriefing questions to discuss in their small groups for a few minutes, and then we talk together. This is a great time for discussion of topics um, or tasks that were particularly challenging. So maybe there's things they should know, but they really don't. And so that's a great way to spend some time on that. And then to talk about communication, giving help, correcting each other, that type of thing. Again, I have not, I, I have big groups. I would wish I had the luxury of smaller groups in which there was that really strong debriefing, um, but, but I do try to allow some time for that. Some tips. Um, it is helpful to have hints, as we've mentioned, and to know what kind you're going to have where and how they're going to get them. I have a little white flag that the students wave if they need help. They're raising the white flag. Um, I am going to start to laminate things um, and include some dry erase markers because this can save on repeat use, repeat printing, all of that. Um, so that can be easily wiped off, put back into whatever box or location it needs to be put in. Again, I do suggest resetting the locks and please keep track of your, write down your answers for each thing, keep them, note which one is your most updated version. And I now have included videos, I put them on YouTube and um, you can do them just as private, but I tend to forget if it's been a semester since I've done something, how the escape room runs. So this helps refresh my memory of exactly how it goes. This is something also that you can send to your facilitators so that they know how the escape room works. They will still be confused as mud or it'll clear as mud for them, but um, that gives them an idea of how it runs. Okay, so I think I am done with my presentation portion. Um, I'm gonna put my contact information up here as well. And I am open for any questions or discussion.